creating the perfect socket for an amputee takes some real skill. And in order to be able to do that, you have to understand these essential rules and principles first, which I'm going to explain to you. Before we can understand why prosthetic sockets look the way they do, we first need to understand the type of residual limb we are working with. In transfemoral above knee amputations, the femur is surgically cut, leaving behind residual limb that presents some serious challenges. It's not load-bearing. It contains a lot of soft tissue, offers limited bony support and is prone to misalignment. The shorter the femoral stump, the more it tends to pull into abduction. Why? because the adductor muscles, which normally help keep the leg aligned, are shortened during surgery. Meanwhile, the abductors stay mostly intact as they attach further up at the pelvis. This imbalance causes the stump to drift into abduction. A similar thing happens in the sagittal plane. The hip extensors are often affected earlier in the amputation than the flexors, resulting in a natural flexion position of the stump. All of this needs to be considered designing a good prosthetic socket. And on top of that, the residual limb continues to change, especially in the months following the surgery. Muscles shrink from disuse, blood vessels adapt, and the femur itself becomes thinner and more brittle. So what exactly does a prosthetic socket need to do? It has to do three crucial things and do them well. First, transfer force efficiently from the residual limb to the prosthesis. Second, support the full body weight without causing pain. And third, keep the prosthesis securely attached to the limb. Sounds simple, right? It's not. These challenges have pushed prosthetists and designers to get creative over the years. For a long time, the quadrilateral socket was considered the gold standard. Right up until the 1990s, the guiding principle was the patient should sit on the socket, not stand in it, on this part right here the ischial seat, which acted like a tiny bench inside of the socket. The body weight was transferred through the ischial tuberosity, that bony point you sit on. In theory, this meant that the user was sitting on the edge of the socket while standing, but this created severe problems. To stop the person from sliding off this bench, you needed a counter force on the frontal side of the socket. But there's more. Because the ischial seat acted like a seesaw, it caused the pelvis to tip forward during walking. So to stabilize it, that front pad had to be positioned above the ischial seat to counteract that rotational force. But here's the catch. This counter pressure is often applied right on the scarpa's triangle, a sensitive anatomical zone that contains the femoral artery, vein and nerve, all lying just beneath the skin. Putting pressure on there? Not ideal. Due to these necessary pressure zones, the quadrilateral socket took on a very specific functional shape. But there was a downside. The residual limb was forcibly shaped to fit the socket, not the other way around. The goal became clear. Design a socket that supports the residual limb in its natural shape and physiological position. And that's exactly what led to the development of the issue containment socket. Even just looking at it, the differences are obvious. In this design, the limb is no longer squeezed or distorted to fit the socket. That's because the rigid ischial seat is completely gone. Instead of sitting on the ischial tuberosity, like in the old design, the tuber ischiaticum is now gently enclosed and supported from all sides. Which is why it's called the ischial containment socket. And here's a major benefit. Since there's no ischial seat, we no longer need the counterforce at the front. That means we can finally avoid putting pressure on the sensitive scarpa triangle and also stop forcing the limb into an unnatural position. So what makes this design more stable? The socket grips around the ischial bone, providing key structural support. A lateral wall helps anchor the limb and prevent side-to-side -side shifting. And the upsides are impressive. Minimal muscle displacement, no pressure on the scarpa triangle, significant reduced lateral shifting, no forward tilting of the pelvis during walking, a better blood circulation in residual limb, and most importantly, a more natural alignment of the limb in space. Bottom line, for most users today, the issue containment socket is clearly the superior choice. But that wasn't the end of the story. Research and innovation kept moving forward, and new socket concepts began to evolve from the basics of the longitudinal oval shape. One of the most well-known variations is the MAS socket, which stands for Marlow Anatomical Socket. 
It was developed by Marlo Otis, who was frustrated by the movement limitations still present in modern sockets. His goal? To create a socket that gives the user greater freedom of movement, especially at the hip. So how does the MAS socket differ? It still encloses the issue tuberosity. But it goes further, wrapping more of the anterior portion of the ischial ramus, giving the limb better containment and control. It also relies more heavily on muscular support, especially from the adductors, to help bear weight and stabilize the socket. This new approach allows for deeper cutouts in the socket's brim, and that brings real benefits. More freedom of motion, especially at the hip, and improved sitting comfort, since the socket's edge doesn't dig in like before. But there's a trade-off. With less surface area in contact, the same body weight is now distributed over a smaller area, which increases the pressure. That makes the MAS socket less suitable for very short or pressure-sensitive residual limbs. Still, for many users, it offers a huge upgrade in comfort and mobility. Another approach comes from the Milwaukee socket. This design takes a different path. It completely eliminates trochanteric support and features a lower overall trim line all the way around. The idea behind it? To achieve secure suspension mainly through muscular engagement and blocking, rather than relying on rigid anatomical support. And yes, 3D printed sockets are already here. Take the socket by Quorum for example. It's printed entirely in one piece and features adjustable pressure zones built right into it. These zones can adapt to volume fluctuations in the residual limb and even change how the socket feels to wear. But also standard sockets can be 3D printed now. This technology is already here. And here's the kicker. Not every user needs a socket at all. With osseo integration, a titanium implant is surgically placed into the femur, allowing the prosthesis to attach directly to the bone. No socket. No suspension system, just a direct skeletal connection and we are only scratching the surface on what's possible. If you found this helpful, make sure to like the video, subscribe for more deep dives into orthopedic technology and drop a comment if you've got questions or experiences to share. It would really mean a lot. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.